Yeah, okay. Good morning, everybody from Tokyo, Japan. I apologize for, okay. for having to chair this session remotely uh, this morning. It's uh, 2.30 here uh, in, in Tokyo at the moment, so we're a little, little jet lagged. So excuse us if, uh, if we uh, look a little tired. But my, my name is Thomas Sullivan. Um, I'm an energy consultant based in Tokyo, Japan. Um, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Carl and Frank and the entire Anthropocene team for hosting uh, the ICCF 24 um, event, uh, which is which has been fantastically organised. I've I've dialed in remotely from Tokyo on several for several hours uh, during various days, uh, and uh, today's session, as 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 um, as notified, will look at the applications of the LENR technologies and fusion energy technologies. And as the um, uh, introducer mentioned, we have four excellent panelists here. Bo Varga from WB Global Semi DE Corp, uh, focuses on semiconductors, water, space, and power related activities. And as mentioned, Michael Guerin from Cognitech, developer of uh, patented technology and alternative power generation uh, and carbon negative fuels, including aviation fuels. And then uh, Peter Shannon of Radius Capital, uh, who runs an investment fund in aviation and drones. And finally, uh, Tito Jankoneski of Air Miners, uh, a global organization that's focused on CO2 uh, extraction. Um, and as I'm dialing in from Tokyo, I just wanted to say a few words about Japan and Asia. Um, obviously, we're still recovering from the Fukushima accident here. We've only got about five, uh, up, up, up to uh, five reactors, which are currently uh, operating after the Fukushima accident. So it's, you know, at most, it'll probably, by the end of this year, it'll be probably one fifth of the reactors that were operating prior to the accident in 2011. But the Japanese government has committed to cut uh, carbon emissions by 45% by 2030 and to be carbon neutral by 2050. So they have committed to invest enormous amounts of money. The new Prime Minister, Prime Minister Kishida, has put a, a lot of uh, investments on the table to decarbonize the economy. We consume about a thousand terawatt hours of electricity here, about 25% of what you consume in the United States. And throughout the rest of Asia, it's about 10,000 uh, terawatt hours. That's mainly China, of course, India, South Korea, uh, and if you count Russia as being part of uh, as being part of Asia. So, um, uh, so as I said, it's about 10,000 uh, terawatt hours uh, of of electricity. So, um, you know, we we're going to ask each of the four panelists uh, to do some self introductions and to talk about. Um, some of the applications that they see here with this uh, with this new technology. So I'll kick off with uh, Bo Varga, if that's all right. Bo, I'll hand the microphone to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody, and thank you very much for Carl for organizing this meeting, and of course with the team, uh, Frank, uh, Eugene, Grant, and so on. Uh, I've been working for about 20 years consulting uh, pretty much in the power space water spectrum. Uh, each one of those obviously are huge areas, so very specifically I work ar around technology commercialization, and I've learned something uh, from dealing with a large number of clients, uh, along with, of course, my network and my associates. We've got a pretty strong practice in the green hydrogen area, so we've learned a lot of lessons about scale. Uh, basically, large corporations want to hear about one megawatt and up. Uh, in 2032, we're looking probably at 35 terawatts of electricity, which is on the order of 35 million megawatts. So a megawatt just gets you into the game. The goal really by these major corporations is to get into the gigawatt scale, and there's a lot of talk about that. Megawatt scale electrolyzers, which is fuel from water, are currently commercial, you can buy them. Uh, Volkswagen Group, for example, has a wholly owned subsidiary which is delivering them right now at roughly a million dollars per megawatt installed. Uh, can be driven by solar, can be driven by wind and so forth. So my uh, personal opinion about LENR is that from what I've heard today and previously, it looks like a very viable source for uh, small scale heating, certainly for a house or an apartment building or a small business. At least that appears to be the current state of the art. 
Uh, but if it's going to move the global needle, it's going to have to be at the megawatt scale, scalable to a gigawatt. Uh, other than that, we've got very active practice in Europe, uh, United States, and also in India. So uh, we're talking with companies uh, such as Shell Oil, Volkswagen Group, Robert Bosch, uh, ENAL in Italy, and in India, a number of different uh, organizations, mostly on the green hydrogen side, but a lot of them, there's an overlap with our work in wind power, in solar power, uh, small hydro, and uh, more generally with fuel cells, which are becoming more popular. And my opinion is in the long run, uh, delivery vehicles, uh, large trucks and so forth will be hydrogen powered rather, rather than be EVs. They'll be FC EVs, fuel cell EVs. Uh, thanks, and I'm happy to share information or ideas with anybody. I'm very easy to reach. Varga at wbgsic.com. I'm best reached by email. Okay. Thank you very much, Bo. Um, and uh, um, I should have mentioned as well, uh, there will be Q&A at the end. So please feel free to raise your hand with any questions. And also the panelists will probably have some internal discussion after we finish with, uh, after Tito finishes. So Michael, if it's okay, I'd like to go to you now. If it's all right. Absolutely. Good morning, Thank good you. afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Michael Gurin. Um, I'm involved in multiple companies in the energy space. Uh, I'll use the introduction that Carl likes to use, which is I'm one of the few people who actually liked thermodynamics. Um, so I'm going to use thermodynamics really to shape um, some of the potential landscape with respect to the applications for nuclear across the board and, of course, LENR. Um, so I'm going to end with this sentence because the rest is going to sound very skeptical. There's a massive application with respect to using nuclear of all forms, um, in my opinion, for converting biofuels into sustainable aviation fuel, green hydrogen, um, and the like. So it ends very, very nicely. Um, there's probably about a terawatt of opportunity. Um, liquid transportation fuels are the most expensive fuels on an energy basis. So it's a massive, massive market. Having said that, um, thermodynamics and a whole range of refrigeration systems, air conditioning systems, really influences the nature of the applications. So not to be completely contrarian to, to Bo in terms of low temperature res, you know, residential, I mean, you have a thing called a heat pump um, and that has what's called a coefficient of performance. And that is a fancy word for saying how much electricity can you use and what's the ratio to be able to get energy out. It's not violating any laws, standard across the industry. Um, and you can get a coefficient of performance depending on the application very, very easily of four, meaning one unit of electricity can give you four units of heat. Uh, if you combine that with a refrigeration system where you want both the hot and the cold, you can get coefficients of performance that are on the order of eight, which means one unit of electricity, it's about five or six units of heat, and about two or three units of air conditioning or refrigeration. Um, so it's a challenge, really, when you look at LENR, um, specifically and explicitly if electricity is the input, that you really have to have a comparison against the heat pump. Um, so um, having said that, if in fact the ratio, um, or it could be heat, that is actually the input instead of electricity uh, to drive LENR, uh, then there is significant potential at lower temperatures. Um, another aspect with respect to thermodynamics to influence um, is that in power generation, um, it's the temperature differential between the high side and the low side. Um, so there is really good um, thresholds with respect to upper temperatures where you start getting into exotic materials. Um, and um, so if you look at both the hot side as well as the cold side, uh, there's, there's really good opportunities to stay around 600 degrees Celsius on the power generation side, which means you don't have to use exotic materials. Um, and if you want a higher temperature differential, you can just reduce the, the cold side um, using refrigeration driven by waste heat to actually get you the electrical efficiency. Um, so, so that's at a high level. 
Um, there's a massive amount of applications that are thermally driven. Um, there's the opportunity to use heat um, to completely take off air conditioning, refrigeration, um, of course, domestic hot water uh, and the like. If you look at the electricity applications currently, um, you can actually take out in a residential and commercial setting about 40 to 60 percent of what's required for electricity. And those are some of the low temperature applications that Bo was referring to. But again, the challenge is you got that good old heat pump, proven technology. And so you really need to make sure that we're looking at applications in which the coefficient of performance, how much electricity in, is in excess of what a heat pump can do. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And um, I think you, you, you mentioned one terawatt of um, potential for aviation. So that is a good entree for Peter to, uh, uh, to talk about as well. Peter, if I could hand the microphone to you. Thank you. Yeah, cer certainly. Th thank you, Tom. Um, so my name is Peter Shannon, and I run an investment fund uh, focused on early stage investments in a broad set of enabling technologies that are around advanced mobility, particularly airborne mobility. Um, I'm an engineer by training, uh, was a software engineer for the first uh, six or seven years of my career, and then have been in the venture capital space uh, since 2005. And I spent over a decade of my time in venture focused on clean tech and sustainability oriented technologies, which you know, as, as many of you know, is a very broad space. Um, it, it's an umbrella theme that covers industries from power to chemicals to transportation and a lot of other areas. And um, within that, I have really focused in on solving sustainability problems uh, with mobility. Um, and at the same time, bringing new technology to bear in the mobility space that delivers uh, on dimensions of sustainability that include uh, quality of life, making mega city environments function more efficiently and, and serve their citizens uh, even better. And so one of the areas where we spend a lot of time is looking at how is technology that has been maturing over recent decades, how is it impacting flight? Um, because we are seeing literally a renaissance right now in aviation and aerospace. And it's driven by you know, two major areas. One is electric propulsion and the new things that that enables. And then the other is increasing uh, automation, which uh, leads us to systems so sophisticated that their behavior uh, approaches that of, uh, of autonomous systems. Um, there's a lot of activity going on in this space. And um, one of the things I would say that is one of the biggest areas of focus in this whole field right now, everything from small drones up to full-sized aircraft, is how do we solve for the energy requirements um, on board these electrically propelled aircraft? Um, more energy on board the aircraft is incredibly val valuable, um, both in terms of the performance of the system, obvious things like range and endurance, but also safety. Um, oriented uh, objectives, the ability to fly in adverse weather and the ability to have um, safety buffers and reserves um, because you are able to bring a lot of energy on board the aircraft. Contemporary energy storage technologies um, are adequate for the first chapter of development in the space, particularly for the smaller aircraft. But when we look at uh, how are we going to uh, green and enable electric propulsion at larger scale aircraft, um, we have a lot of uh, technology work to do. Um, obviously, I think that the, the technologies that we have been discussing this week here have absolutely game-changing potential for this space. Now, at the same time, uh, the aerospace industry is a conservative um, uh, place. They're, they are risk averse. There is a, a huge amount of um, essentially safety culture that runs throughout the, uh, the entire community. And so the, you know, the things that the aerospace industry is going to want to see is how do we, how quickly can we get this technology to technology readiness, readiness level nine? where we can um, not just 
uh, deploy it at scale, but where we have such certainty of the control and operation of it that it can be employed in um, absolutely safety critical uh, propulsion system uh, applications. Um, but I think that there are, are, you know, from what I've learned so far, there are a tremendous um, number of pathways for us to get there. And the aerospace industry um, values this type of energy capability so much that, um, that we're going to see uh, embodiments of it, especially at the smaller scale, that I think are going to be very interesting and that are going to be purely enabling for the industry. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Peter. Very interesting. Um, uh, Tito, could I could I ask you to um, uh, to take the microphone then uh, from the uh, CO two perspective? Thank you. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so one of the challenges of a changing climate is that there's uh, about a trillion tons of excess carbon dioxide that we've already put into the atmosphere, um, and so the, the IPCC says we need to get to about ten gigatons per year of of removing carbon dioxide by 2050. The challenge is that's a, that's a million fold improvement from where we are today. Uh, so how do we do that? That's where, uh, you know, Air Myers is working in the field of, of carbon removal. Our, our specific focus is on getting uh, new solutions created. So new ideas, new concepts, new startups, uh, working on pulling molecules of carbon dioxide, invisible gas from the atmosphere and either storing it or turning to a product or figuring out you know, what, to, what to do with it in a way that, that removes the carbon uh, from the atmosphere. In particular, uh, you know, that's gonna require a lot of energy. And so uh, I'm here as a you know, curious uh, person understanding better you know, what, what kind of options there are, uh, there are here and uh, towards, towards removing literally billions of tons of, of carbon uh, from, the, from the atmosphere. And I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, Tadu, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, if I could just um, maybe, yeah, as I said, we can uh, open it up for questions. I, I don't know if you guys on the floor uh, in uh, on the side can can pick up any questions there. But uh, Tadu, I was just curious. Obviously, I, I talked about Japan having to decarbonize by 2000, you know, 45% by 2030 and going carbon neutral by 2050. But based on what you heard about these technologies, over the last few days, um, you, you know, do, do you think this is, uh, I've obviously heard that maybe, you know, the delivery date on some of these technologies could be 2035. So, you know, what's your perspective on the timescales here for decarbonizing and, and then when these technologies might, as Bo says, might be available at scale? The timescales seem impossible, but necessary. Uh, and it's something that I wake up every day and think about is, you know, when, you, when you're faced with an impossible problem, but a necessary one to solve, uh, how do you go about, about doing it? And that, you know, the spirit here is very much in, that, uh, in, in line with that. It's how do we take on something that seems like it's, it's not going to work, but we need it to work. Um, whether you're, I mean, you know, the, the fundamental problem of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, a huge part of it's energy. I mean, in the sense of even, even if you're talking about, uh, you know, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere using, you know, with, with, with trees or with, kind of ocean processes, all those things are fundamentally powered by, by energy. Uh, even on the other end where you're saying, okay, we're going to have a, you know, a chemistry or a machine or a process that, that pulls molecules of carbon from the atmosphere. Again, this is all, this all comes down to a, uh, to a, to a, a problem of energy. Um, and so approaching that of, of how do we scale that up is, uh, is essential to getting to gigaton scale carbon dioxide removal. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, but Bo and Michael, I'd just like to ask you as well if um, maybe you could say a few words about the applications for emerging markets, if you don't mind. Uh, you, you, sp you spoke, you know, about electricity, some of the industrial uses, et cetera. Do you have a perspective on, on how these uh, technologies could be used at scale and uh, in, in, in the emerging markets? Bo, you asked me about Japan a few days ago. But, yeah. uh, uh, well, yeah. I wouldn't call Japan. Hold on, let me take this off. Of course not. I, wouldn't, it's, it's, I would not call Japan an emerging market at this point. Oh, however, uh, I can assure you that large industry in Japan, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, for example, is building the first hydrogen transport vehicle with the concept of importing hydrogen from Saudi or from Australia. I think Australia is the pilot project. 
If you're looking at uh, Mitsubishi Power, they have a line of hydrogen gas turbines today from small to large, uh, which will work on 30% hydrogen, 70% natural gas, and so forth. If you look at uh, Mitsubishi resources to uh, metals, uh, we actually have a relationship between the company I'm advising. Uh, they've agreed to commercialize in, in Southeast Asia, East Asia, a really advanced uh, PEM catalyst, which will improve the performance of both electrolyzers and fuel cells. I didn't mention in my introduction that everything I do is really driven initially by materials. So I always look at materials and how they could improve efficiency. For example, uh, boron arsenide can improve the efficiency of heat removal and semiconductors. It's got about almost 3x the capacity of a diamond for that case. So that's a very interesting material play. For the emerging markets, uh, you have to work with the big corporations, either in Europe, Japan, uh, uh, India, or China. Our India connection really has been uh, a prime driver be behind electrifying India since 1980. So they work with all the major corporations. They also have existing uh, relationships in Southeast Asia and also Africa, which is very common for big India companies. So I think that uh, every place on the planet, every place in the solar system, all, all, even on Mercury, you have water. And, you, and of course, Mercury has tons of sunshine. So when I think when I talk about space as well as Earth, uh, I see water electrolysis as a prime driver. Uh, it's available at scale today. Uh, I would say we'll see the first gigawatt installations certainly by 2030, maybe by 2026, because megawatt scale electrolyzer are being sold today. So I think the scale up, it's not straightforward, unfortunately, because they're taking kilowatt uh, scale electrolyzed and scaling up to a megawatt. So. Uh, but new designs are being uh, um, are being developed today to go to go straight to a megawatt rather than scaling up from the kilowatt level. So uh, and then so a megawatt scale electrolyzer is much easier to scale to a gigawatt than a kilowatt electrolyzer. That's for sure. Uh, I, I think that if you go uh, at least in the countries with like heavy industry uh, technology and money. Uh, Hydrogen is going to be the winner. However, there is lots of segments to hydrogen, obviously. And there's a one big issue. No one has solved the long-term storage, low leakage problem. If you liquefy hydrogen, you're putting a lot of energy in and to keep it liquid. So there's some real issues there. I, I, could, talk, I could have a Q&A for a month around hydrogen, so I won't. But I think that hydrogen will impact uh, the uh, less developed countries faster because there's less competition, there's less installed base, and there's less politics. Uh, uh, if you're not mining coal today, you're not going to be a big coal supporter, unlike, you know, U.S. and some other countries, Germany and so forth, India, that do mine coal. And, and by the way, China and India, between them, the last I read, are adding one new coal burning plant every week. So I think stopping the addition of more carbon dioxide is at least as important as figuring out how the heck to get it out of the uh, atmosphere. I think we need to have a two-pronged approach there. And I think the cost of hydrogen is gonna drop drastically in the next five years uh, by uh, on the order of at least 50% in five years. Uh, and also, as long as gasoline prices stay around $6, you're pretty close to price parity today from, from some hydrogen technologies. They're running around $8 per gasoline equivalent. So. And, and if we get gasoline at $10 a gallon, then hydrogen is uh, gasoline equivalent today. So, uh, I mean, I, I know no more than you if we get $10 gasoline, but I can say this, that any country on the planet has access to water and sunshine, and that's what you need to get uh, fuel from water. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Bo. Uh, just, uh, you, you know, as you raise the issue of the cost of gasoline in Japan, we're paying 25 cents for a kilowatt hour of electricity. That's what I'm being billed here. So I hope these new technologies will also bring down the costs over time. But um, Michael, uh, just wondering if you had any kind of perspectives on the um, on the emerging markets and applications. Yes, so much to say. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, in terms of the 
emerging markets, uh, I think one of the most important things, which deals ties into what Peter was saying, in terms of we we have to think about quality of life, um, and if we think about quality of life, especially in emerging markets, but we're seeing it throughout the world, um, the planet's getting hotter. Um, the dominant and the projections. You look at Europe, doesn't have air conditioning. They clearly need air conditioning, emerging markets. Um, air conditioning, refrigeration, and water are the fundamental elements that are driving this. Um, lots of good news associated with it, um, but it's probably not ironic. Though I don't know that Carl is thinking about it in terms of here. Um, so we have to do things that scale massively. Having said that, if you look at the computer industry, right, mainframe, then we went to us having supercomputers, relatively speaking, that we carry. Uh, thermodynamics really, really, really wants, um, especially when you can use waste heat to drive domestic hot water, air conditioning, refrigeration. Thermodynamics wants to be at the point of consumption. So it actually does not want large scale systems, it wants small scale systems. So if you look at emerging markets where they need clean water, they need air conditioning, they need refrigeration for food, um, they want small scale systems, um, millions of them, if not billions. Um, so you have that contrary with respect to the other two things further in terms of benefit and nature already did them for us. Uh, the cheapest form of ice storage, especially uh, is the cheapest form of storage. If it's cold is ice water. You can cycle it as many times as you want. Um, so that's good for, you know, low cost storage. The other nature created, which is biomass, which is basically the cheapest form of st solar energy. Um, and I'll just leave it. We just licensed the technology from Pacific Northwest National Lab, one of the Department of Energy National Labs that allows us to upgrade bio biomass to biofuels, creates as a free byproduct, uh, green hydrogen, uh, so the ability to cost effectively at yesterday's gasoline prices, pre-Russia, pre-Ukraine, to be able to produce biofuels at a dollar a gallon with free hydrogen as a byproduct um, is absolutely there. No moonshots required. So, um, so I agree with green hydrogen. Um, I think the pathway is we literally can do that for free um, as a byproduct um, and just tying in Peter's comment, the airline industry is extremely conservative. Um, biomass is the only inherently low capex method to do c carbon negative. Um, and fuels are the most energy dense form compared to batteries and hydrogen. Uh, so you do actually have solutions that can be done today. Again, no moonshots required. And, and, and to that, I would add that, you know, in the developing world, one of the biggest areas of growth is air travel. Um, when, when you look at the aviation industry, um, sales of aircraft are uh, growing the fastest in those parts of the world, and miles traveled by uh, the people in those regions is growing the fastest. Um, there has been, you know, in, in, in my world of aviation, there has been a huge amount of attention placed upon how are we going to green commercial uh, air travel in the near term. Um, this has been a particular point of emphasis over, say, the last four years. Um, and there are different approaches that are being taken. Some are looking at a technology-centric approach and thinking about um, hydrogen-fueled aircraft, literally new airframes and propulsion systems at the commercial aircraft scale that they want to bring forward. Um, there are a lot of us in the industry, myself included, that uh, think that a faster path, if we are really serious about reducing the carbon footprint of commercial air travel by the mid 2030s, then we have to acknowledge that this is not simply a technology puzzle that needs to be solved, but this is one that involves people and organizations and best practices that have been established in the industry for a long time and things that are already proven as safe. And we really look for a way that the air travel industry can stand on the shoulders of what it has already built and deployed and the training that the people from the people in the cockpit all the way through to the ground service people that are around the aircraft and the infrastructure that is at the airports, how can we stand on the shoulders of that 
to deliver this carbon footprint reduction as quickly as possible without having to treat all of those dimensions of it as sunk investments or to have those constituencies of people pushing back against this greener future because it threatens their own investment in the training or the uh, role that they play today. So that really leads us to focus on how can we create um, uh, fuels that fit within today's infrastructure that are used in airplanes that you know the contemporary pilots of today are already trained and certified in and that all of the other uh, ground service staff and fueling infrastructure around commercial air travel um, can uh, leverage and embrace immediately. Now, there's been a lot of work done in sustainable aviation fuels. And when people look at pathways to those fuels that involve some kind of a biofeedstock or that involve photosynthesis, essentially, uh, in the early stages, um, given the scale of commercial air travel, if you really want to take that up to high scale, there are you know, a lot of unintended consequences and a lot of complexities in that uh, feedstock supply chain that become evident. Um, where I think that you know, the, the industry deserves to place a lot more attention and where I think we have some real potential is in building on the production of green hydrogen um, and building upon the idea of creating the precursor molecules to these hydrocarbon chains that form, you know, kerosene like type uh, fuels, aviation fuels and scaling up the technology to produce those synthetically in a way that in many cases is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and a way that is using renewable energy in order to form uh, these fuels and treating the hydrocarbon fuel as really another energy storage medium. Um, Doing that obviously requires cheap, green, uh, baseline uh, energy generation and um, uh, to do it at scale and to do it economically. And so I think that that ties in as one of the pathways where this type of technology can find its way into making a big impact in aviation um, without actually necessarily flying on the aircraft itself, if you understand my point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Tito, could I come back to you uh, again, just and ask about some of the, um, you know, CO2 removal technologies that you think, um, you know, would could could leverage these new technologies that we've been discussing for the last few days. I think when we spoke a few days ago, you know, I'd mentioned this new uh, um, uh, train technology that was being used to pull CO2 from the uh, from the uh, from the atmosphere. I was just wondering if you could fill us in on, on some of the uh, applications you've you've uh, um, you know uh, uh, studied in the uh, you know during your, uh, your 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 work your research yeah certainly like I said you know every, everything to do with pulling molecules of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere comes down to using energy to do that that thing it's not something that's going to happen so much just kind of thermodynamically naturally at all um, I think the most immediate uh, kind of end of that is, yeah, things you can either plug into an outlet or things that need heat. Uh, and that, you know, brings up more of the direct air capture side of things rather than the, say, uh, growing trees or doing things in the ocean, things like that. Um, so direct air capture uh, specifically is this, it's a machine device that's built to uh, filter through air, grab onto molecules of carbon dioxide and, and kind of filter them out or concentrate them uh, in a way that you can either then store the carbon dioxide or uh, or use it or do something else with it. Um, and so, yeah, you know, director capture is one that I that I think of, kind of primarily when I think about, oh, yeah, you know, easy ways to connect to a to a new energy system. Um, for the others, kind of a bit more indirectly, if you're talking about, uh, you know, maybe indoor farming or, or growing, uh, growing trees in some kind of way, I think there's ways to tap into this as well. But uh, kind of the, the easiest option is is kind of from the from the director capture perspective. So. We see new director capture companies popping up that are, you know, they're working on either uh, using electricity or using heat uh, or a combination of both to be able to pull carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, and like I said, yeah, that's the that's the most, you know, center of target. Yeah. You know, this is a, a good way to to make use of energy immediately. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. Can Michael, just, yes, go, go ahead. just real quickly, um, in terms of direct air capture, uh, 
um, I think a low hanging fruit uh, is actually indoor space. So there's a, every building such as the building we're in has fresh air exchange requirements. Fancy word for saying if there's too much carbon dioxide in the air, they calculate in terms of how many people you have to bring in fresh air. So number one, the CO2 levels are gonna be higher. Number two, if you do that, you'll actually reduce the amount of energy consumption that will be required for either air conditioning or heating. So it will actually partially offset uh, the amount of energy that's required. So it's small scale, um, but every building, um, it would actually have a beneficial effect with respect to air quality, as well as reducing both, whether it be heating and or cooling, the amount of energy that's consumed. So I would highly encourage on direct air capture to look at indoor space um, as a as a really, really good candidate because uh, it will offset some of the energy. Yeah, certainly. I'm um, seeing seeing more uh, startups, you know, starting focusing on the area, uh, either using, uh, you know, indoor air and capturing it. One of the challenges then, well, what do you do with it afterwards? Where does the carbon dioxide go? Because if you if you just release it, doesn't it doesn't help anybody. Um, so, you know, that's you, you have to solve that whole that whole problem is how do you pull carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, either store it or turn it to a product. Um, and so, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges there, one of the opportunities that we see at, at Air Miners is, boy, you know, there are a lot of interesting ideas. We should go and, and pursue those. We should, you know, come up with come with concepts, come up with ideas, help create new startup companies. There's on the order of 3000 people working on carbon removal solutions around the world. So you know, smart people can kind of come up with ideas and, 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 and point out a rock that has not ever been overturned or ever been, ever been looked into. Uh, and that's something that really gets, you know, the, the team going, everybody's part of air Myers and in the community is, you know, there, there are, there are plenty of opportunities to figure out how do we pull carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere because it's, it's simply been something that we haven't really needed to do or really looked into uh, before. If you think about kind of the, the history of carbon removal, if we're, if we're at the, uh, the carbon removal history museum someday, uh, you know, the, the early devices that we have, I mean, stuff in, you know, the, the international space station, space travel, pulling out, um, pulling out carbon dioxide from, from indoor systems, same with submarines. There's also kind of this, this like other kind of historical thing around capturing carbon dioxide from industrial smokestacks where you've got highly concentrated uh, sources of carbon dioxide. But that's it. There's this sort of lineage of carbon rural technology is, is pretty thin. Um, and so we're, you know, in some sense, you could think of it like, you know, we're kind of at the beginning of today, the beginning of whatever the carbon removal history museum would look like. Uh, and, and someday people will come, you know, to the, to the building, just like they come here to this beautiful computer history museum. But that's, that's kind of where it's at. Um, and that's a really big opportunity. So for anybody that's listening, that's interested in, in carbon removal, I'd tell you to check out, uh, check out air miners uh, as a way to to work on ideas, create new concepts and, and startups working on some of these things like, you know, how do we take carbon dioxide out of the air from uh, from indoor uh, air circulation systems? How do we leverage that? You know, let's let's go get to it and, and figure that out. Uh, and the other thing and the other thing and the other thing. So there's plenty of plenty of room for opportunity to to, to jump in because we're at the beginning of creating this carbon, this air mining history museum together. So OK, thank you, Tito. Bo, I think you wanted to say something, did you? Yes. Uh, yeah, very specifically. Uh, I've worked uh, with high tech companies since 1968 and I lost a lot of money uh, get being way ahead of the market. So I'm very market driven. And if you do an approximation of the numbers in the next 10 years, uh, you're looking at over a trillion dollars will be invested in hydrogen in the next 30 years, uh, 5 trillion, 10 trillion. So that's enough money to actually move the needle. And very, very specifically, the way human beings work, the political systems work, you can slow, if you don't like something, you can stop, you can slow down doing it, stop doing it, and then reverse the effects. And we see this uh, all the way back to Roosevelt, you know, after the Great Depression, when the agricultural land of the US was being destroyed and they built from Mexico to Canada, they there was reforestation all through the, the high plains and the Rockies to try to stop soil erosion. So I think, unfortunately, the way humans work is we create the problem first. So the first thing is to slow down and stop doing it. And so I'm, uh, I'm a great believer in hydrogen and airplanes because using carbon, uh, 
you you can't get off the carbon cycle if you keep using carbon. I, I'm a, I mean that to me that's just basic logic. Now, uh, the carbon usage for the next fifty years, uh, even with uh, hydrogen, uh, even with LENR. Uh, and by the way, the U.S. government right now does everything it can to, to slow down or stop new fission because the basic, uh, doesn't matter what fuel you want for your nuclear reactor, they charge $25 million. So I'm, I'm talking with a group that can build a very nice one kilowatt reactor for, for space applications for a billion dollars. No refueling for 10 years. You get dust storms on Mars. You get the lunar night uh, where solar doesn't do a thing for you. Uh, and you're, gonna, you're not going to move megatons of battery packs to Mars or, or to the moon, for that matter. And yet, at 25 million bucks, you know, it's cost you a million bucks to build a reactor and the U.S. government charges com for commercial uses $25 million. It totally crushes small fission. You know, so, so I think policy changes. By the way, there is an alternative. U.K. is cheaper. France is cheaper, India is cheaper, so we're not stuck with the U.S., but the problem is if it's U.S. technology, then you have to be able to export it to some other country for fueling, right? So that creates a whole new can of worms. Anyway, I, I'm, as you can see, I'm a big believer in wind and solar. Uh, I think uh, I'm a, I love distributed energy. I'd love to get totally off the grid uh, personally, uh, but... And I'm prepared to pay the pri reasonable price, 10, 20,000. I can't afford to pay a quarter of a million to get off the grid. So uh, I think that uh, hydrogen of, is, is one path. I, I'm, I'm a great believe, uh, it'd be great uh, if, if Michael's uh, technology throws off hydrogen essentially for free. Then you only have one problem, compressing it for transport. And that, that's a big issue. I mean, if you can use it locally, that's great, of course. No, you still stay on biofuels, so you use that for mobility, and you use hydrogen for stationary applications. Yeah, but you still want, you got to store it. If you don't, oh, okay, you use it as you produce it. You saying. do it on demand. Yeah, okay. Demand. Well, if you can do load following, that's great. Yeah, that 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 would be very productive. I'm looking mostly at fuels because we're looking at space applications, obviously. So we got to, and a lot of. Rockets today use hydrogen, even the ones that don't. The methoxy guys use, you know, CH4 plus uh, plus uh, hydrogen and oxygen added. So, but uh, go ahead. Thank, thank you, thank you both. Thank you, Michael, as well. Um, uh, Peter, I wanted to ask you um, uh, also just about the defense industry applications, because obviously, you know, I think Michael referred to this crisis that's currently um, ongoing, um, but you, you're watching that industry closely. And uh, just one of the comments in the uh, in the box that I'm seeing here is just about Agenda 2030. Um, and Naveed is saying that we need more awareness of Agenda 2030 and nobody disagrees we must clean the planet, but we need full transparency on all actors. So I don't know if anybody uh, wanted to comment on Agenda 2030, but Peter, if you could uh, give us your uh, perspectives on the, on, on the defense industry applications, if, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it really has impacted both ends of a very big spectrum. Um, number one, obviously, this, te this technology um, has big geopolitical implications because it moves us away from uh, you know infrastructure that runs society, energy infrastructure that depends upon fuels that are unevenly distributed around the world, to energy infrastructure that is dependent upon knowledge and technology production. Um, and so that's one side of the question. The other side is much more tactical, um, and that you know we are like so many parts of the economy, we are seeing such rapid change and innovation and in how this technology of all types is being applied in defense. Uh, we're witnessing it with the war uh, in Ukraine this year, um, and we're, we're seeing it in a lot of other domains as well. And one of the themes that is surfacing from all of this is in, in, uh, an increasing demand for very long-lived autonomous systems that operate in all domains, uh, underwater, in the air, um, in space, and others. And the energy systems that power those uh, are a critical uh, enabler to this, uh, a highly, highly differentiating enabler 
for these types of systems that if we had very long lived sources of energy that could be um, put on board these different systems at, you know, at small scale, um, you would end up with uh, literally black and white transformative capabilities for how you gather information, how you move throughout the world and having uh, systems that can deploy on very, very long deployments and be very long lived and, and play a passive role most of the time um, and then uh, activate when needed during a time of conflict. So there's, uh, there's a lot of thinking. Uh, there's a lot of uh, creation of concepts of operations around these. And there's a lot of experimentation going on um, across, particularly across allied militaries in this. So um, this, this could be a, a very interesting avenue for, uh, for the further development of this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, anybody wanted to uh, ask the fellow panelists uh, a question? Uh, did you want to raise uh, any any issue? Michael, did you want to raise any issues with Peter? Because I know you also cover the sustainable fuels for, for aviation or, or vice versa. Um, well, I would just add uh, the delivered cost of jet fuel for the military is $30 a gallon. Um, so the ability to actually produce fuels in a forward operating base using the waste and or locally grown biomass um, is actually a fundamentally real probability. Um, secondly, most of the lives, um, if you look at Afghanistan, et cetera, uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, I'm sorry, uh, most of the lives that were lost by soldiers were actually escorting f fuel supply lines. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's potentially a low hanging fruit also for hydrogen um, as well so i would just add add that um, the department of defense um, has huge motivation um, regardless of what we think about them um, to to move towards a new fuel source um, and if it can be a locally fuel source at the forward operating base um, it has major ramifications both in terms of the soldier's life um, as well as the economics themselves yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. One big, one brief comment on the military side. Uh, the microwaves from space has been revi rev revived by the space force. So they're proposing satellites in space that would be microwave power down to the, your tank, armored personal carrier or forward base. Anyway, there's money there. That's for sure in the DOD budget, right? So I, I'm sure that there'll be some sort of prototyping uh, platform that will actually accomplish that. Okay, fantastic. Do you have the DOD telephone number, Bo, that we could uh, we, we, we could call them? Not in my head, but in my computer, I'm yes. Joking, of course, yeah, understood. Thank you. Uh, one, of, one of the issues that, um, you know, we, um, that we'd like to look at as well is if the science is proven for these new technologies, how, how would we integrate them into the global energy system? Um, or Michael, do you kind of have any perspectives on on, on that? Um, I, I clearly have a bias, right? So I keep coming back to the same thing. Um, biofuels are distributed, biomass, the conversion process can take place literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we're talking to some indigenous um, groups in South Dakota. They have tremendous solar and wind assets. Of course, both of those are intermittent. The ability to put a large scale nuclear reactor, 500 megawatts, a gigawatt, um, literally can make these places that have water assets, land assets, um, renewable assets. Um, there is no fundamental reason why these places can't become, quote unquote, the Saudi Arabia uh, within the United States. Um, so it addresses not in the, in the NIMBY issue with respect to nuclear. There aren't too many people in South Dakota sorry if you're from there um there's lots of land so it really addresses i mean some of the obstacles when you think about um you know nuclear the dominant one being nimby right not in my backyard uh, so i think that's a real real opportunity and the scale again is massive i mean you're literally talking just in the united states you can support 500 gigawatts um 24 7 365 just to upgrade biofuels Right. 
Okay, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, Bo, I was just um, you. You're involved in the semiconductor business as well, and the water areas. Uh, I, I think maybe it was Michael who talked about some of the water applications. But did you did you want to say anything? Obviously, you guys have just passed the the uh, the semiconductor bill in the U.S. the fifty two billion dollars over five years. Um, there. Well, I, I'm very much focused on the power semiconductors, so I should be clear on that. And there's a massive move away from silicon to silicon carbide and gallium nitride. Uh, the bottom line is that if you look forward, say, 20 years, the only place you will use silicon ever is where lowest cost. If you want the, the best energy density, you want the uh, highest power, uh, silicon dies. Also, at high temperatures, silicon carbide semiconductors have been run successfully for 10,000 hours switching at 500 C which means a lot of applications for sensors and semiconductors opens up. Uh, in fact, a test at NASA Glenn, switch, silicon carbide switches operate up to 980C before they, st the, they started melting, you know, so the lattice was no longer ab able to sustain uh, switching capability. So uh, I see silicon carbide as a huge growth industry. It's quite small today uh, in the scheme of things. Uh, this year or last year is the first year a billion dollars worth of chips were sold. The U.S. drove the, the technology all came from Sweden, still does, but U.S. company Wolfspeed got enormous amounts of military and other government funding, and they're now the world's largest player uh, with the Chinese as fast followers, and then uh, the uh, Taiwan and, and Singapore and Japan kind of trailing behind. So really... In the next generation power electronics, I, I would say U.S., China, and, and Europe, just to be fair, there's a number of big companies in Europe that are like Infineon and ST Micro. So on, at the other side, uh, we've been looking at the power problem of uh, drones on the moon or in any uh, low gravity or zero gravity, and 90% of the power is consumed by the silicon. 10% to maintain or create an orbit or change orbit. So uh, we've got our own little stealth project going uh, maybe uh, a couple of years away from publishing anything. But we've been looking very seriously at how the uh, animal brains operate, how the neurons operate, started with human brain, uh, too complicated. So our project right now, we filed a grant application with NASA, is to model a honeybee brain uh, for drones, uh, and that would be fundamentally for uh, low gravity or no gravity to reduce the power requirement by 90% plus. And it turns out the honeybee behavior is very well known. There's been a tremendous amount of research, uh, MRI and, 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 and PEM, and I mean, all sorts of scanning technologies. So it looks like there's a fairly reasonable development path. We would implement it initially in FPGAs and then spin some sort of a uh, AI chip, but which will be hopefully about 100 to 1,000 X less power and also smaller. So the yield per wafer would be much, much, much higher. So yeah, I'm following the field, but right now we only have really one. We've got some interesting design studies for silicon carbide. And the only active project really is the notion of modeling a honeybee brain in silicon, because it turns out you get incredibly complex behaviors applicable to drones. Uh, with a very few basic algorithms implemented. Uh, w w I mean, the, the, you'd be surprised how little the thinking a honeybee has to do to avoid, for example, a dragonfly uh, or to find uh, the pollen source and to lead other bees to the pollen source and so forth. Anyway, that's kind of, uh, right now we're at TRL2 and hopefully get to TRL3 or 4 in the next couple of years. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bo. And uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to close this session in a few minutes. I think we close at, uh, at uh, 11.50. So um, I'd like you all maybe to say a few words, uh, you know, before we exit. Uh, Tido, could I start with you? Would you um, maybe do a little bit of a wrap up for um, what you'd like uh, to, uh, conclusion from your side? Yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, I think about uh carbon rule as a as an energy user, uh, we want to do a lot more of it. We want to we want to be able to create the the demand for for more energy, create the, you know, the need that, hey, this this really, you know, we're, we're asking you, please create, you know, create more energy sources. Um, 
I think part of that is I'm, I'm working with uh, Felix and, and Kimberly as part of the Audacious Billions for Climate Project. Uh, and they're working to how do we unlock uh, billionaires to, to invest and donate towards new carbon rule solutions that are getting created. So really, again, like driving up the demand for, uh, for the use of, you know, of energy towards pulling molecules of carbon from the atmosphere. So I wanted to highlight that as a new well, project that's coming out. And uh, you, yeah, great, great to be here and hear about everything everybody else is working on. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I would just reiterate that the, um, the, the most direct path for us to create a big carbon impact in existing commercial aviation um, is going to be through harnessing abundant, cheap, renewable energy to um, uh, synthesize uh, fuel at scale. And if we do that, not only will we have made a big impact on aviation, but we will have created for us for ourselves a new uh, method of energy storage that is going to have broad impact across many other parts of the economy. Um, and then I would also say that, you know, as this technology uh, reaches higher and higher maturity levels and we build more experience with it, um, it becomes a very interesting uh, energy source for other types of smaller autonomous systems that have very unique uh, long endurance, long lived characteristics. So, uh, you know, we've spent some of the time this week uh, talking about the state of the technology, the state of our development of it. Um, and pathways forward as well as impacts. And, and I can say that from my perspective, the second order impacts of this type of capability are just absolutely enormous. And it's a very exciting thing to be working on. Okay, thank you, Peter. Michael? Uh, in a few sentences, uh, the planet has known that nuclear power is the only source of nuclear of energy. Um, it has decided that uh, biomass is a really nice way to store it. It's also decided that ice is a really nice way to store it. Um, and um, I think if we go back to the future, the solutions are there. Um, so I think it's just looking at the market. Um, all the technology is there. You go back to the Prius. I mean, so if you combine all the really amazing stuff that's happening with electric vehicle and you go with deep hybrids, for whether it be aviation or what have you, or including long transportation, um, all the problems have actually been solved, in my opinion. Uh, we just need new engineering models, and we need new business models, um, and I think really back to the future is the way to go. Thanks very much. It's very positive, uh, Michael. Bo? Uh, I just want to say that if you love technology, this is the most exciting time ever to be alive. There's fundamental and breakthrough technology in every field you care to name. Uh, unfortunately, I have a limited brain, so I'm only tracking about 20 different fields right now. Uh, I wish I had a lot more brain capacity, so I'm waiting for the brain implant. And then I have a pretty interesting project for Michael. We have demonstrated uh, a catalyst that does water electrolysis at room temperature, and that's all that's required. In other words, uh, of course, if you add some heat, the electrolysis improves uh, in terms of the uh, how much you get per minute or per hour. Anyway, I'm hoping that uh, we can get something together in, in the way of a, uh, a demo unit, and then uh, maybe we can talk to Michael and see how this may relate to his work. Right. Well, thank you very much, Bo. And gentlemen, thank you very much for participating today. And again, thanks to the ICCF team uh, for hosting us. Uh, and we look forward to future dialogue on, on all of these issues. So, so, so thanks a million. Good luck with the rest of the conference today. See you all soon. Bye-bye.